Good afternoon and for those of you I've not met, my name is Caroline Wilkie and I'm the CEO of the Australasian Railway Association. Thank you so much for joining us here for our rail safety conversation as part of Rail Safety Week. Before we proceed, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, our colleagues who are in Victoria today uh, and a special mention to those in Auckland who have woken up to some interesting news this morning. We just wanted to say that we're thinking of you all and uh, hope to be able to see you all sometime soon. And thank you very much for the sacrifices that you're making on behalf of both Australia and New Zealand this week. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional landowners on the land we meet. Uh, I'm joining you here from Canberra, so I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, specifically their elders past, present and emerging. This week is Rail Safety Week. If you've been on LinkedIn, uh, you would know that there's a lot of activity despite the restrictions around Australia. Uh, we've had some fantastic media coverage around the country about the initiatives of Rail Safety Week, which is fantastic to see. Um, this is our first ever Rail Safety Conversation online webinar event, and I'm pleased to say that we have over 350 people registered for this event all across Australia and New Zealand. By running this session, we want to acknowledge the very important role that safety leaders play in the rail sector. Uh, they play a critical role to ensure that we deliver better uh, and safely for our, our customers and for the public at large. During our conversation today, our panellists are a group of high profile safety professionals uh, and they'll represent very different areas of rail safety expertise, uh, looking at both innovation and safe work practices. We also want to discuss uh, safety focus has changed in, as a result of COVID-19, um, not only for our staff in, in rail businesses, but also for customers and passengers around the country. Before we get started, I just want to go over the technology items so you can actively participate in today's session. Uh, today's session is live uh, and it's an interactive panel and I'm pleased to say we've already had questions come through. You should see a control panel on the right hand side of your browser that looks like the screenshot we have displayed. Uh, you have the opportunity to, to submit your questions uh, by typing them in and if you want to direct them to a particular person, please just include their details and I will know who to ask the question to. So I'd like to now take the opportunity to introduce our panellists. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Arthur Lucas, our Deputy Executive Director from Sydney Trains. Thanks for joining us, Arthur. David Bainbridge, Project Director, Safe Work Improvement Program, Corporate Services and Safety at ARTC. Thanks, David. Uh, Hugh Bridges, Chief Safety and Assurance Officer at Transdev Australasia. Welcome, Hugh. And Hugh. Sandra wilson Wright, Safety, Quality and Environment Director at Theolis Downer on the beautiful Gold Coast. Thank you, Sandra. So just introducing everyone in a bit more detail, Arthur has been with Sydney Trains since 2008. He's responsible for supporting frontline customer service delivery uh, through the workplace uh, workforce services unit, facilities management and customer operational support. He's also looking after procurement and list logistics and the training capability functions for the frontline customer facing staff. He has been responsible for the customer service and cleaning response to the COVID-19 pandemic. David has more than 40 years experience within the mining, construction and transport industries. He joined ARTC in 2018 as the General Manager of Risk, Safety and Environment for Corporate Services and Safety. Uh, but in November, David was seconded to head up the Safe Work Improvement Program, where they're developing eight interlinked projects with a team across the ARTC. Uh, to look at existing processes and changing the culture in safety. Hugh uh, is a public transport specialist who has multimodal experience across Europe, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, he's worked in a variety of safety and operational areas um, and the public transport space uh, and he is just an expert on safety and uh, we're very lucky to have him here today. And Sandra is joining us, um, having worked in the rail industry for 18 years, holding senior leadership positions at Freightlink and ARTC. Um, during her career, Sandra is focused on national rail reform and she joined the lighter side of rail in 2019 and is enjoying working for Keolis Downer in the role of SQE Director on the Gold Coast. So thank you, Sandra. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, 
based on my experience with the last conversation I, I ran, there's lots to talk about uh, and so we'll, we'll make a start. So obviously rail safety is complex and ever evolving issue. Um, I want to start by just asking each of you to provide a bit of an introduction on your top rail safety priorities and or challenges. So I'll start with Arthur. Uh, thank you. Um, look, I think um, working predominantly, you know, sort of customer service frontline, yeah, the, the priorities for, for us at Sydney Trains are really around how we help our, our staff and the um, in that frontline environment. So Sydney Trains, roughly around 2,000 frontline customer service attendants, station duty managers, working platforms, um, working, you know, sort of gate lines around station environments. So, yeah, we're really trying to help them around sort of, you know, repetitive injuries, dealing with customer um, initiated violence and, you know, issues that are arising. Um, and sort of, you know, the aim is how to, how to help them sort of, you know, um, maintain, I guess, their sense of health from start to finish of their shift, be that through, you know, obviously the work that they do, the breaks that they have, um, even their, their physical and mental sort of health as well through that period of time. Yeah, and we're doing that through, you know, support measures, you know, a number of um, even things like cooking schools, yeah, um, helping them with, you know, conversations, employee assistance, manager check-ins, to really just um, even having physios at certain environments to help them where, you know, they're raising a flag for eight hours a day. Um, how do they help them stretch? How do they help them you know, sort of, I guess, you know, relieve some of that tension or that stress or pressure that, that is sort of arising, you know, sort of as they're, they're sort of, you know, dealing with their day-in, day-out role. David, obviously um, you're looking at it from an ARTC perspective. What are the, the key issues for you? Uh, I think um, for our business as a whole, because we're, uh, we're covering so many states with such a large geographical network, um, trying to maintain protection of our key staff whilst making sure that we uh, meet the freight task that is required in Australia um, is proving very challenging as things, as we know, change day by day. Um, and it's also about making sure that all our people, whether they're in an office or whether they're on frontline on an infrastructure maintainer or a network control officer, uh, they're all personally uh, being impacted by COVID at the moment, and it's it's about trying to make sure we provide the support um, that we isolate those key staff, uh, network control centres, and uh, provisioning centres, which are our depots, um, and making sure that our office staff are supported because a lot of us are working from home. Uh, me included, because you know we don't need to be in an office. We have technology these days that works, um, and therefore that adds different complexities to people's lives around managing children, or in my case, two dogs, um, and uh, and making sure that they've got that support, um, and that we seem to be delivering um, as well as we did before. Um, we just need to make sure that um, we're giving the people the support they need to help them do their jobs properly. Mm, absolutely. Uh, Hugh, what are the, the big issues for you at the moment? Okay, um, thank you for the introduction a little bit earlier. And I always, always like it when someone says that I'm an expert because I just feel a little bit like I want to pull back. And I know that <laughs> although I've been in the rail industry for a number of years, I've still got plenty to learn uh, and in public transport. So I think. I don't think any of us are experts. We might be reasonably good at our jobs. But uh, anyway, um, I've taken a slightly different view. So um, first off, just who am I or who are we? So Transdev operates uh, in 17 countries with 85,000 employees. So we're quite a big business. We're a multinational. In Australia, we've got about 5,800 5, employees, 1,900 vehicles, vessels, and so on. Um, and we operate uh, across, let's say, uh, Western Australia, Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales, and the North Island of New Zealand. So we've got a fairly big footprint here. Um, and unfortunately, living in Sydney, I've been able to come into the office, which means I've been able to access the technology as I am today. But in answering this question, I wanted to try and take a slightly different approach. I mean, we've talked very much about COVID and we talked about individuals. And I wanted to try and be a little bit more challenging around 
rather than just the COVID issue, what some of the issues that faced the rail industry and public transport as a whole. So uh, I went through the usual challenges like managing people risks and uh, managing operational risks such as SPADs and this and that. And I thought, well, we talk about these all the time. They're, they're not new. So I thought I'd focus on two key challenges, um, recognising we live in this complex world of railway operations. One is complacency and the other is interfaces. Um, so we know that um, this industry has made great strides in improving safety over the years. And to a degree, this level of performance has reached a point where in Australia today, I hear the question being asked, how safe is safe enough? Uh, and it is a question I heard in the UK about 20 years ago. How safe is safe enough when you're investing a lot in rail safety and we can measure to quite a high degree how safe we are? And I must say, as we improve the, and address safety risks, introduce new technology and improve safety to staff, customers and others, including contractors, of course, this is a perfectly valid question and one that needs to be asked regularly. In addition, we do need to ensure that we remain cognizant of the increasing cost associated with this safety investment. However, we must also remain vigilant and not become complacent. Just because our overall safety performance is improving and we potentially haven't seen a fatal accident for many years, we need to be aware that there are parts of the industry where the risks remain very high. And I refer to track workers, and I know there's a further question coming up about that a bit later. This is an area in which traditionally hasn't seen such significant levels of technological intervention and certainly hasn't seen the, the, the amount of financial in, investment either and the risks to individual workers remains quite high well, remains high and that for me is a worry and that's a pocket of the industry we might just sort of if we if we're not focused as passenger train operators we might not recognize the track worker risk and that the fact we have colleagues out there uh, at risk and my other point of uh, focus today is interfaces interface management and the potential risk when something goes wrong, i.e. the fa failure to communicate important information, to advise, to consult when needed, etc. I see that many national models include the sp splitting of responsibilities across multiple parties, such as splitting infrastructure from train operation, etc., each of which brings an additional interface or plethora of interfaces in some cases to manage. An additional party with whom cooperation can be vital in the delivery of uncompromising safety and all of whom need to work collectively for our industry, our collective industry, to work effectively, efficiently whilst maintaining a safety. So for me, there's a need to maintain a close eye on each of our interfaces, being clear of the potential risks associated with each one and ensuring that these are effectively controlled. I also think that we must always be aware of complete that must always be aware that complacency as a danger of creeping in. And I think some of the issues we've seen around COVID-19, certainly in, in New Zealand, where everyone was quite happy we've beaten it. And then last night at 21.15, the Prime Minister came on the television and advised Aucklanders they were in a lockdown um, level three, and that the police would be guarding the nine main exits to Auckland to make sure that people did not leave Auckland. I think that was a surprise. So there is always a danger of complacency. And we must maintain a clear focus on our operational discipline and keep our guard up. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> Sandra, um, obviously you come from, from a light rail perspective. Um, what are your key issues at the moment? Yes, the lighter side. Um, well, you in some respects stole, stole part of my thunder <laughs> um, because uh, the, the one challenge um, I think we all face is, is complacency. Um, I think that is the number one. How do we keep our systems and our processes uh, current and refreshed and renewed when, um, because people reach what they expect norm to be all at different levels. So, um, you know, so the thing is that something will, something will change, people will pick it up, people um, have, um, their perceptions that may take that may take them further in experiencing that this is the way that we do things around here, whereas others a much shorter space of time. I mean, um, um, complacency. You, you, you look at the um, you look at the um, uh, your, your children compared to your grandchildren compared to your uh, your parents. Everyone has a different threshold, so. For me, it's how do you maintain uh, a um, an effective, efficient 
safety system to ensure those complacencies don't set in. And COVID-19 has just exploded that tenfold. Um, and it's something that um, here, um, particularly on the Gold Coast, we're continually pushing out to um, all of our workers uh, because we we aren't experiencing touch wood um, the um, the impacts that are seen by our um, by our brothers down at Yarra Trans, um, uh, the border rail industry in Victoria and New South Wales. So um, so that's a good thing for me. I, I had a perfect example this morning. I, I, I walked just behind one of our workers in the door this morning, and we've got two sanitising stations that signs up everywhere. We tell we've got workplace principles that say. You know, wash hands, sanitise um, um, on entry to the depot, and I saw this person just walk straight through, past both. Um, um, on a brighter note, I was um, when I happened to just mention that internally, somebody actually followed that through to find out who that was, and just as a tap on the shoulder, you know, please be mindful. So it it just the smallest things. It, it just takes one thing. Mm, absolutely. Uh, certainly, I think that, um, you know, in terms of complacency for some parts of Australia, I mean, I know from talking to, to family and friends, different parts of Australia are going through different cycles in the COVID process. So, yes, I certainly think complacency has the potential to set in in some areas. Um, one of the things that I've found quite interesting is talking to members uh, over recent months. And uh, one of the issues that comes up again is how old the industry is and about um, our capacity to adapt and use technology and, and modernise given the age of the sector. Um, David and Hugh, I know we had a spirited conversation about this previously. Do you want to, to share with us some of your thoughts about um, uptake of technology and safety improvements? David, I might start with you. So uh, we say the rail industry is old, um, but I started my career in mining, which is as old as you can be, digging holes in the ground. So we're not that old an industry, but I think we've become an industry that's bound ourselves up in multiple layers of rules. And those rules are quite often are not that clear. Um, those rules can quite often be contradictory and we make it incredibly people who work very hard to be successful to actually be successful. And I think we need to take a, a, a holistically different approach because if we keep trying to write more rules, we're just going to end up doing what we've always done and we'll slowly become insane. Um, so we need to take a step back here and we need to get a blank sheet of paper and we actually need to say, you know, there's technology out there. And I was talking to Sydney Trains this morning and they're trialling a GPS locator worksite limit and possession limit marker, which means that the age old issue of being able to find out where you are on the railway, you know, instantly we can use technology that will actually go, well, actually, you're not there, you're here. And they, they believe those markers are accurate to within five to 10 millimetres. Um, so that gives us then the added advantage. You can then start to work out which track you're on. And if we use technology through GIS mapping, through LIDAR, through uh, smart iPads in the field, we can start to equip our people so that they have a framework around them that means they can actually make a mistake. And the system will catch them in the mistake and support them to make the right decision. Because the, the interesting thing about humans is there's only been a Mark One. There's never been a like an iPhone. We're on whatever it is, seven, ten, eleven, twelve. There's only a Mark One human, and it's fundamentally flawed. It will always make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So we've got to work with that as a premise. We will make mistakes. We need to equip people with processes that allow them to assess risks and really deliver a, an informed decision. We need to give them tools. Um, that are 21st century tools um, and we need to be able to let those people make decisions in the field on a risk-based approach of what the best solution is based on the environment around them because no amount of rules will ever tell you what the environment on that day is and they will never be fully uh, supportive of that 
environment in which you're trying to deliver work. Mm. Yeah. That's, uh, thank you, David. That, that, that's a very interesting challenge. And I think from, from an operator's perspective, um, I can sort of uh, back that up that to, if you're expecting a driver or somebody to have five, six, seven hundred pages of rule book in their head, memorised line by line, as you say, we're Mark 1 human. Um, we're very good at memorising those things we do regularly. But as soon as you come to that, uh, that point of uh, out of course incident, you're struggling. Huh? And I think it's how we help our all of our individuals, be it track workers, be it drivers or, or station staff, how we actually put that information in the hand. So what they've got, the things they do every day is in their head, and that's clearly where it is. But how do we put all the rest of it in their hands in a simply accessible, easy to understand, easy to read manner so they can refer to it without feeling a bit of a nana? Because I know when you talk to people, they say, oh, well, I didn't want to go to my rule book. I didn't want to go to my track diagrams. I didn't want to go to it because I was under pressure or etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think there's a piece around technology i think there's also a piece around in, in those perturbed situations we're saying to staff it's okay to step back it's okay to take count to 10 it's okay to think it's okay to look at your the information you have and we don't we're not expecting you to react immediately um but just thinking about the technology piece i mean certainly in the wider sense um i i think the, the railway across the piece has has, has demonstrated over its 150, 160 years plus, that actually we don't always need very expensive, swanky technological fixes to reduce risk. Some of them are really simple, and maybe we should be looking for some more of those as well. Mm, very good point. Um, Arthur, the theme for Rail Safety Week this year is um, Rail Safety, it's everyone's responsibility. Um, how do you find uh, is the best way to get this message out in, in areas. And I suppose just reflecting on you and your team, how do you get that message out that safety is everyone's responsibility? Yeah, look, I think part of the challenge um, these days is, yeah, everybody's, um, I guess we've touched on a bit complacent, especially the longer you've been in a role, the, the more, I guess, you know, um, you tend to run on autopilot you know, sort of some days, um, especially, you know, given that you might be influenced by things that occur outside of work or things that have occurred on the way to work and all of a sudden you've turned up and you might not be, you know, at, at your best on the day. Um, I think the we, we've recently launched, and I guess the Sydney Trains uh, strategy launched last week, and we have a couple of key um, sayings that we've always sort of talked about, and that is uh, whilst the customer's at the centre, Safety is at the core of everything we do. And so, you know, when you, you're being asked to do something, regardless of how little or how big it is, is just, you know, sit back and ask yourself the question of what I'm about to do, is that how, you know, um, somebody else will do it? Is that how I'd ask, so somebody in my family to do it? Is that how I'd ask a new employee that's just sort of joined me at, at this sort of station or this depot or this, um, you know, sort of environment to, to walk through and do something. Um, and we've sort of started that, you know, um, that safety leadership sort of starts with me and it also goes down to our individual employees as well. So, um, you know, Sydney Trains, we have a, a great um, internal um, workplace, which effectively is a Facebook for, for work. And yeah, the message is cascade and yeah, we'd be surprised. We started it a couple of years ago and yeah, there's, there's Oh, thousands of messages that are being pushed on there a week by the employees themselves that recognise great safety behaviour, great customer behaviour, and also um, situations that may, um, you know, sort of teach others how to go about and do do certain aspects. So I think um, the way society has changed has required us to adapt to how we change the message of delivery. You know, in the past you print a poster, you'd stick it on a notice board, you'd hold a briefing, you'd make everybody sign to that that briefing and say, right, you've been briefed, go and do it. Um, yeah, without really showing people what to do and how to do. Whereas now with our workplace technology, um, we can shoot a video of someone doing it. Um, we can show people via a quick um, distribution of emails that, or text messages that send everybody to that email that shows them again how somebody doing it and doing it safely and you know people tend to learn either through um 
their own experiences and doing things and practicing things or observing other people doing things and practicing things. So when you, you really want to um, build on a, a safe culture and a safe environment within your, your sort of business, especially um, on a front line where you know, you're interacting with millions of people um, sort of a day that use our network, the best way to do is sometimes to show. Yeah, and then once you can show people and they can really get a grasp of what that that looks like and feels like, we find that that, that provides a, um, I guess, a, a far better outcome and positive experience than sort of either sticking a poster up and briefing people or sticking them in a room and trying to t um, teach somebody how to do something. Mm, wonderful. Um, I actually had someone who's just uh, posted something on here to ask, you know, how do you mediate some of those uh, internal pages if, if other staff can post whatever they want on it or do you have some controls over it? Um, look, we, like all of IT in, in any business and being a public um, organisation, there are rules and, you know, code of conducts in terms of what we do and how we do things. Um, so, you know, we have those in place. Um, our internal comms people will will monitor what's going on there and what's you know sort of being put on. To be brutally honest, um, there hasn't been a lot of people that have taken advantage of of the the um, workplace um, pages because it is um, it's almost self regulated by our people. Yeah, they're posting mm -hmm. things up for their own benefit and they're posting things up for, you know, passing messages and, you know, they're putting their own compliments up on people doing great work and safe work and things like that. So um, people don't want to get on there and be, uh, you know, through lack of a better word, Debbie Downer on what's going on and how it's, you know, um, somebody's done the wrong thing because you're actually one, not only are you breaching a code of conduct, but you're also bringing to light other people within our business that, you know, potentially might not have been trained or may, or sorry, I shouldn't yeah. say might not have been trained, but may not understand the real way to do it. So that that um, self-encouragement and self-promotion has been a, a, a huge success um, in our business since we, you know, sort of launched it a couple of years ago. Great. Um, Sandra, uh, we talk about safety culture, but obviously it's, sometimes it's it's challenging to turn something um, tangible that resonates with the, the work community. Um, what does tangible safety culture look like from your perspective? And I'm interested to hear some of your examples. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, I think with um, safety culture and trying to uh, change safety culture, and or you know, some people always talk about embedding, and it's it's not a thing. It's something that um, it, something that evolves, um, and there are a lot of um, um, uh, training programs and, um, and and we've we've all we've all done it and we continue to do and we always will. So, but as a business, uh, we spend a lot of money on these on, on these leadership programs and um, a bit like the flares. You know, don't throw it out. You know, ten years time you'll be bringing things back again because um, because it just seems to uh, it seems to come come into a program comes into the company. You roll it out. Um, for very good, obviously for very good reasons, um, because it's not because it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so the uh, when I I've been up on the Gold Coast uh, now here just over just over twelve months, our time flies, and uh, and uh, there was a leadership program that um, was starting to roll out or had rolled out and was continuing to roll out when I when I first started, and which was great. It was um, and it's a, an amazing an amazing uh, program, but um, but my thought went to okay, we've got an opportunity here of not just rolling this out. Um, uh, all the hours uh, taken from uh, having our staff involved in these um, number of days to to uh, to to go through the program. So it, it was for me. It was like, how do we keep this going? Um, so the where where we um, where we do that and how you can start to turn your leadership programs and whatever that's made of is it's often set on a common language. So it's about extracting what those what those lessons are and bringing that language then into the organisation and continuing that on. 
So uh, as an example, um, as an example, you can pick, you know, you pick those up, you'll embed them through your processes, your, your procedures, right through to the front line, to forms, to, um, to your internal communications. You just keep reiterating the same terminology and ultimately that starts to become the norm and the way that you do actually do things around here and those prompts come up. So the, um, we've been really, uh, you know, touch wood, it's twice today and I don't like saying this, um, very often, but we've gone 17 months now without without an LTI, um, which is um, which is which which is great news. And um, uh, but it's you know again the complacency leads in. You know, we, we need to maintain and just keep that keep that message um, to, to everybody. Mm, absolutely. Um, David, we've had a bit of interest in the program that you're working on at ARTC. Are you able to tell us a bit more about it? Yes, I can. It was uh, formally launched this morning as part of Rail Safety Week by our Chief Executive and Managing Director, Mark Campbell. Um, and we did that with a, a, a safety video um, of what, uh, what, uh, what safety means in ARTC, which is fundamentally at the core of everything we do. Um, it started um, initially with uh, feedback from our safety culture health check, which we compiled with Deloitte, um, and that raised some real um, niggly things that the people at the front line were telling us that didn't work for them, uh, which was around rules and not being able to find the right information they needed, um, and uh, they didn't feel supported in. Uh, all areas of the competence around training and competence around protection officers. Um, and so we took that on board along with our staff survey um, feedback and also uh, a number of safe working incidents near misses that we've had where we looked at it, really started to navel gaze ourselves and say, well, you know, it's we need to improve this. Um, we held workshops with people. We had um, brainstorming sessions where people could basically put anything on that whiteboard as being a solution. And we sifted through um, all of those and eventually we boiled it down into 19 solutions which fit across eight project streams. Um, and they are focused around protection officer improving the training and the competency framework for protection staff, safe working staff, um, including um, making sure that we focus not just on the technical skills, can you interpret the rules, but the soft skills that that person requires around being able to understand risk, about being able to plan work, about being able to effectively brief people in the field about being able to make decisions and stand by those decisions if it's not safe to make sure that we don't go ahead. Um, and it's about trying to elevate that safe working person to, to a higher level in the pecking order, if you like, so that they can actually make those decisions and feel supported to make those decisions. We're focusing on clarifying um, the information that people need to work on. Um, we have a, we've got a motto now that it's got to be available in three clicks. Um, so you come into our system, we're building a portal that allows people to access the, the spot, the single point of truth. Um, and in three clicks, you've got to be able to get there. Um, and that's following examples from, from RISB and, and RSSB in the UK, where you can access the the level of information that you need and it's very easy and simple to get to. We're also mm -hmm. focusing on communication and uh, anybody who's worked in Australia on the rail industry knows that most of the communication you hear, um, no matter which organisation it is, is, yeah mate, you're right mate, yeah I'm right, we're right, oh I'm here mate, yeah, oh I'll be right, yeah, and that 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 is a cultural change that we are making driven through our network control centers and the great work done by our network control teams 
where we're starting to push now that you must use the phonetic alphabet. You must use the correct information transmission and use the correct phraseology, not just, yeah, mate, I'm right, I'm here, I'm good to go. Um, and that will that is a that will impact culture because it will start and create a more formality around how we transfer and confirm receipt of information. So we're also looking at, at how people access the corridor, and this is about trying to get people to plan more. Um, because again, what we see is uh, almost the firefighter mentality. We turn up, we do a job. Um, what we really need to do from a safety point of view and a risk point of view is start that planning work using, uh, in our case, Ellipse as our asset management system, which allows people to um, know where they need to be and what work needs to be done. And then we can integrate that planning which it makes it efficient and safe because you've not got conflicts. And then we can declutter the amount of information that's going through network control. An example of this, we use an app called ETAP, which is the same as Transport for New South Wales uh, Electronic Track Worker, um, which allows you to, to select your, put the information in about the protection you're taking in New South Wales, and you don't have to ring the network controller. Um, in five months, that's reduced the number of phone calls by 40,000 around that number to network control alone. So a network controller, yes, wow. Network controller's mm. job is to safely path trains to where they need to go. Um, so if you remove 40,000 phone calls to those network controllers, they're allowed to get on with their real fundamental focus of their job. So we, we're looking at how do we create a system that says you can, I now need to get in the corridor, I need to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C. When I've done all of those, which is going to be around pre-planning and understanding where you are, what you need to do, then we can, um, we can do that through an app. That's technology working for good. Mm. We're also going to look at um, the way we assure that that's happening. Um, which is a is a is a you expect people to do the right thing, but how do we know they're doing the right thing? Um, and that's that's really that's what my program's about. Eight eight projects, nineteen solutions, and and uh, it's the end of month. Well, we're one and a half months into the program now. Um, we are also, as I'm quite sure, that somebody will raise on the questions. Yes, we are part of that work is, is uh, aligned to an enforceable voluntary undertaking with ONSA and we've worked in partnership with them to, to try and work together to deliver industry um, uh, improvements and, and a, a spin-off of that is through RISB and Jesse Baker, we've now got a working group that is Sydney Trains, QR, MTM and ARTC where we're actually collaborating and sharing our uh, improvement programs, our solutions, our IP, because there's no IP in safety. It's, mm. you know, we're all trying to do the right thing. Uh, we've been talking to other operators around the country, like PN, um, who are also interested in the work we're doing, and it's about collaborating and sharing for the greater good. Mm, absolutely. To that end, um, the ARA is looking at um, currently terms of reference around our safety working groups and committees to be more active in that space too, because absolutely information sharing is key. Um, I'm going to mix it up a little because I'm getting lots and lots of questions that are coming in, but there are a couple of uh, two particular issues I did want to cover off before we move to questions. Sandra, I'll start with you. Um, obviously, you know, safety has a lot of different elements. Um, but antisocial behaviour is, is front and centre, obviously, for our workforce. Do you want to talk a bit about that issue? Uh, yes, um, and I can actually share a, a, a case study um, as, as well, which, um, which will be quite poignant, but um, I think a, a, um, a stark reminder of the world that we're currently in. Uh, 
we, we have seen a uh, quite dramatic increase in antisocial behaviour um, of this year. Um, we've talked present um, with COVID-19. Uh, the, um, just the, com uh, not the word complacency keeps coming up, but the complacency just in uh, youth in particular in Australia, um, we see um, just does have no definition these days. It, it used to be, uh, respect your elders. Um, they just don't respect anybody anymore. And I won't say everybody is an 80-20 rule. I'm sure 80% of them are fantastic. But we we do have we do cop and see um, a lot of that a lot of that 20%. So the um, the days of um, standing up and letting somebody sit down. I don't know. I'm sorry, my posters change every now and again. I do have a um, sit down one that they bring in every now and again. <laughs> sit sit down, but. Um, the um, yeah, so it, it it goes far and beyond. Um, obviously, the the, uh, the drugs and all those other societal issues that um, that that go with it um, just enhance and and chroming, which I've never heard of. Um, obviously, very naive and all of those things that go on that, um, that that are just escalating. The kids just find any any anything from Rexona um, deodorants or or paint or diffuse, or, or all those, um, all those other chemicals, just to just to get that hit. So, um, just on a on a case case study, I, I would just like to to share um, uh, our um, parent company, Keolis. Uh, we had a, a fatality in in France. A gentleman called, and I do hope I pronounced this uh, right for any um, any of my French counterparts who are who are listening. But uh, Philippe. Mongello um, in in France, um, employee that um, unfortunately lost his uh, life during COVID nineteen to a horrific um, uh, passenger attack. Uh, masks uh, like they are in Victoria now um, were were mandated. He left home that day to do his job and um, approached um, approached um, a, a group. Um, and ask them to uh, put their face masks on, and um, unfortunately, was horrifically um, attacked. The um, the there were lessons learnt um, that have been shared uh, through Keolis and uh, Keolis Down over here here in Australia, and uh, a lot there from you know reviewing of equipment, um, training, increasing uh, numbers of staff who are out there and around people, uh, but. Um, I think the other part to this is that regulation side of it, um, as far as a broader societal issue in this space, and 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 that is really challenging our legal system to um, find some more responsibility for 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 these outcomes. I mean, we find particularly uh, the youth. Um, I mean, I'm talking some some sub ten. Um, it's it's uh, it's quite confronting. Um, and but uh, but it's real and uh, yeah so the yeah so just to I'd, I'd personally also um, just like to acknowledge uh, Philippe and his um, wife um, Veronica Veronica I suppose we would say here in Australia and and of course their children so mm, it's just terrible um, mm. I think it's a good segue um, to the COVID conversation I'm very conscious of time. Um, Arthur, you've been leading Sydney Train's uh, response in terms of sta station staff preparedness to COVID. Um, what are the lessons that you've learned from, from your time working on this to date? And, and I'll pick up then with the other speakers if anyone else wants to talk about what lessons you've personally learnt around COVID. Arthur, do you want to start us off? Yeah, look, thanks. Um, look, this has been a really challenging uh, yeah, piece of work. I think at the start of the year when we first started to to sort of um, understand what, you know, sort of coronavirus and COVID-19 was. Uh, I'm not sure we all really, there was a bit of a sense of panic in terms of what we did and how we did things. But, you know, we focus really, I guess, from our point of view on on two things. So if I was an employee coming to work, what would I um, deem as, you know, safe um, practices? So things like we increase cleaning um, internally within our own office environment, within our operational areas within our um, office environment, uh, within our 
you know, depot environments as well. Um, we increase cleaning in the customer environments as well. So we we took um, some internal cleaners offline and they visited our top 50 stations uh, twice a day and just wiped all hard surfaces down. And yeah, then we brought on contractors that did that for us and then we moved them to trains where, you know, every train on the network throughout the course of the day will get, you know, sort of five wipe downs through their, through its you know, a, B, a to Z journeys throughout the course. So, um, yeah, we then started with our guards and drivers and we started to wipe their cabs down as well so that from a, an employee point of view, they felt safe too, um, to then making sure that customers, uh, what else could they see and feel? So we we, we introduced hand sanitizer stations at every at every of our train stations and in some places they had, you know, sort of five or six of those in the environment that they had. We introduced some hand wipes, so some antibacterial hand wipes where they could take with them on the train. And if they really felt like they wanted to wipe down the, the pole they were going to hold or the seat they were going to sit on. Um, it, it really has been, I guess, such a changing environment day in, day out. And our customer expectations have really increased in that security and safety and you know, cleanliness sort of space. Um, so we've really focused on that part. But, but what we have done is, um, We've done it with our people, and I think that's been the most important part in it. We've held um, twice a week conversations with our health and safety um, reps throughout the business where we've had, you know, um, updates on where things are at, what's going on, how it's going on. We've we've introduced and we've brought the unions along for the ride, and we, you know, industrially we've sort of put aside any differences to how people do roles and what they do and how they do, and we've, we've sort of said, look, we're all in this together we're trying to keep our people safe, to keep our customers safe and to keep everyone, you know, sort of employed. So let's park some of the, I guess, the industrial issues and sort of focus on, you know, the greater good. And then with our leaders too, we've had to help them understand that, you know, um, in the past, someone taking a day off for because they had the sniffles um, was kind of almost, you know, frowned upon because, you know, we everyone would take a couple of codrill, come to work and, you know, as the ad says, you know, you soldier on. Whereas now we're we're encouraging people that, you know, stay home. You know, if even if one of your kids are sick, stay home because ultimately it's better that you're safe and healthy and, you know, um, not put at risk because we've seen, and to touch on the antisocial um, behaviour piece, that um, there's, there's a lack of tolerance now amongst some people to... Another person's, um, you know, sort of coughing, sneezing, um, just being in their space and sitting near them, that tolerance level where previously, you know, our trains were at 100% to now they're at 20, 30% capacity, yet still people will feel that someone is still too close to them. And that can sometimes lead to a different type of behaviour that our people sort of have to deal with. So, you know, um, no one can set hard and fast rules around, you know, COVID and the response. I think our response has really been around um, what's changing, what's topical, what's the health advice from New South Wales Health, um, and what can we do to adapt to give everybody a sense of comfort that um, they can physically see things cleaned, they can physically see people being, you know, sort of proactive, and they can feel um, and gain some comfort around seeing people doing the right thing, but also being there to help them as well mm. and that's really been our primary focus. Does anyone else want to make any comments around COVID? You or Sandra? Come yeah, on. I can, uh, yeah. Uh, oh sorry. You oh, go so oh, oh, okay. There's so many, there's, there's so many lessons. I, I think the thing for me is that you just have to be so adaptable and agile. Um, adaptability and um, agility, it just Things are just changing, um, as examples given this morning. I um, and I, I remember those very early, very early days at the beginning of this back in um, February, March, and uh, you know it was just constantly updating, changing uh, documents. Um, uh, things just changed every day. But um, I, I think the other part to it is that we really have to start thinking outside the square with um, uh, with with our processes and our practices, um, obviously in, in a in a safe safe way, and 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 I say that in a lead up to our um, change of management, 
management of change. Uh, that sometimes when you're in that, um, things just have to be done and let's just go, go, go. And you, and you start making change and you forget to sort of sit back and think, okay, if I do that, you know, what's going to change and what are the impacts? Uh, so that's something that's always been in, in the back of my mind um, through any changes that have had to uh, occur quite rapidly through this. And I think the other thing, sorry, the third thing, one, two, three, is that, um, you know, we, we just had a, or we are having a, uh, what was probably all on our risk registers as a, um, a high consequent low likelihood um, event occurring that I wonder if we now should be turning that to a high consequence, high likelihood um, uh, occurring and, and ensuring that we've got more controls in place moving forward. Absolutely. Hugh? Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, and picking up Sandra, what you're saying about uh, the unfortunate uh, events that happened in southwestern, uh, sorry, southeastern France um, with, with your colleague driver, that was horrific. Um, and just picking up on that, and what, one of the things that has been quite notable for me now, I'm getting stats from all of my businesses across Australasia, and we normally track the level of assaults per million kilometres operated, which is, a, which is a metric we use. And because we've been operating all of our vehicles, it's a nice flat line, it's not changed. But of course, recognising that our patronage has dropped from you know, by 80, 90, 95 percent in some places, yet I'm still seeing the same number of physical and um, or almost the same number of physical and the same number of verbal assaults or, uh, on our staff says to me that the rate has gone up. And I know one of the PTAs has shared some figures and I won't say which one. When they normalise by passenger journeys, um, their assault rate has gone up by 200 percent during this crisis. So. So for me, that's a real worry. It's either an indication that people are very stressed or that the people that are, uh, have, have poor behaviour, the ones we don't want to travel are those that ignore all of those instructions to stay at home. So for me, that's rather, it, it makes me question sometimes human behaviour and, and, and who we are, but that, that's one thing. The other thing I thought was quite interesting, I picked up on earlier this week, is that RSSB has been doing some modelling work in the UK now, this is based on a particular rail vehicle, a Class 800, and it's based on the London North Eastern Railway. Um, but they've done some modelling around the, the chance of a customer catching uh, COVID-19 on a train. Now, we keep getting told by various experts we shouldn't be travelling by public transport. That's the message out there. Yet I'm expecting my drivers to get in the cab of all of my vehicles against that advice and drive. So th there's that negative messaging coming out, but but the work from RSSB, and as I say, it's around one kind of train, and it's a particular customer, and they're working on that, is um, one chance in 11,000 journeys. Now, it's really early figures, uh, but it's a big number. That's what struck, struck me. We hear all the negative, and that started for me to put it into some kind of context, and I'll certainly be watching that RSSB research to see where that lands, because I think that's an important for us as an industry, because at the end of the day, we need our customers back. We are a Absolutely. customer. And if they're not here, why are we all here? What's our raison d'etre if we have no customers? So for me, that kind of information is important. I'm looking forward to getting back to hopefully the post world. And I think that issue around antisocial behaviour also throws up an issue that we've been discussing internally around you know, rail industry workers, particularly the front facing workers as essential service workers. And the fact that they're putting um, themselves at risk in some circumstances to continue this work and whether or not the penalties for this poor antisocial behaviour is adequate given the seriousness of the situation we're in. And certainly there's a review going on in Queensland at the moment that we're engaged with and we're just looking at different um, different jurisdictions on that as well because obviously we want to protect the, the rail workers around the country. Um, Hugh, it's a good segue into a question I've got here about uh, and I guess you can talk on this, um, you know, given different modes uh, around how you engage and uh, your staff around this safety message when there's so much pressure at the moment with COVID going on. I think it's, that, that's always an interesting one for me, how, how we engage with our staff and particularly at this moment in time when um, as management teams, we all seem to be experts by, by our staff. You know, this, this crisis has arrived. It's, it's for us to step up to the plate and deal with it. And actually, I must be honest, we've had to had to scramble a bit to get up to that point of expertise, using the term lucidly. Uh, I mean, but uh, it, it's certainly been a, a big step up. 
Um, for me, it's just about engaging, 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 engaging. I think Arthur spoke to it and David spoke to it as well within his project and, and Sandra as well. It's about having that relationship with your staff and continually communicating with them, being honest and open. I think mm. for me, it's being honest and open. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. Um, and, and then sh sharing their concerns and try to alleviate those concerns. Um, mm. I, I think it's as simple as that. And then there's all, all these magic bullets we talk about. It is about staff engagement. But one thing I thought that Arthur did say that was quite telling for me, and in some ways I wish we could bottle it, um, because we could do with pulling that bottle out regularly, which is when we're in these kind of situations, you can put all those industrial relations issues to one side and you can overcome anything. And then in a year's time, two years' time, we'll be wishing for that bottle of overcome everything. I, I, I know because uh, it's nice to be able to take that out of but uh, it's unfortunate that the pressure of the situation helps us, can help us to to uh, to work closely together with our frontline staff and, and address these issues. But it's 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 the um, magic of the time. I feel like we could have done another hour on this conversation broadly, and I think we'll have to have another one. But I do want to try to wrap up um, with a question around uh, just personally, and this is not necessarily an organisational um, commentary, just so everyone doesn't get in trouble where they work. But if you, if you were looking at safety issues in the mix at the moment, if there was one safety issue that you'd love to get resolved, your teeth into what whatever, what would it be? I'll start with you, Arthur. Um, look, that's a really interesting one, but I think um, for us. Um, is the amount of people that say um, fall within a gap between train and platform. Um, yeah, huge numbers. And whilst we've done a lot of work um, over the years to reduce that, um, one is way too many. You know, and I think that you know, the first day of our um, new CE, uh, there were two at the one location, both children that sort of you know dropped between the train and the the platform there and you know I think if if we could do anything um, identifying a solution that met safety um, standards that met engineering standards that adapted to different modes of train etc cetera, etc cetera, would be yeah um, on the very high on the wish list. Wonderful David. Well I I, I actually guess uh, I'm actually doing uh, the thing that I would like to fix. Um, so whether by design, which I don't think it was, or or good luck, or or just um, you know I should have bought a lottery ticket at the same time. But I was given the opportunity to change. Certainly, ARTC lead that change and try and guide our collective knowledge to a better space, and therefore create. Uh, a much safer and uh, efficient environment for our business. Um, so I've actually been given my dream job um, to to try and deliver this program of work. Probably ask me this in two years' time as to whether I still think it's the <laughs> dream job. Um, uh, we've had a lot of interest in the program, so I'll make sure that we send around the information <laughs> now. We can update yeah. tomorrow with the launch today. Um, Sandra, what about you? Uh, so I, I, I think the thing for me would be um, definitely the issues with um, antisocial behaviour because that extends um, uh, so much further um, through society as a whole, but within the rail industry, just the protection of our staff. And um, I must say that's the one thing that um, um, really probably keeps me awake at the night. At, at night is the protection of our frontline workers that are out there. Mm, absolutely. And Hugh, what about you? Obviously, you've got different modes that you're thinking about. Yeah, I'm just sort of running through in my head which one which one would I pick? And I think it, it, it's difficult because there are so many in the rail industry. We talk about customers, we talk about staff safety at work from assault, and then we talk about the operational risks. I think we're, we're trying desperately to, to, to fix all of those things. But... Uh, I suppose one of the things that um, always comes back to me is, is the issue of, of individual self-harm mm. and, and how, and, and I'm not saying that we have a fix for that, but but for me, if I could if I could wave my magic wand, that's probably the one I'd fix. Certainly 
not only for the individuals to plan, but also for the for the staff that have to deal with it. So, so that's mine. Absolutely. Our um our sister organisation Track Safe is doing a lot of work in that space, but absolutely, it's something that it's a very uh, important area for us to focus on. Um, we've run out of time. I think what this whole session has shown us is that we should, we need to break off some different conversations about antisocial behaviour. Certainly, um, uh, you know, station safety. Easily do a whole hour on COVID, I think. But I just wanted to thank Sandra, Arthur, David, and Hugh for your time today. It's been fantastic. Uh, we pulled this together at Short Notice for Rail Safety Week, and we greatly appreciate all of your time. Um, uh, just in terms of feedback on today's event, there will be a short survey at the end, so I do encourage you to take part in that. For everyone who sent through questions, thank you, and I apologise if we didn't get to them. We'll see what we can do about answering some of them after the event. Um, but have a lovely afternoon and have a great rail safety week, and thank you for taking part. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you.